Now to our main program. Did you know that the Burke Museum was originally established in 1899 and traces its origins to a high school naturalist club formed 20 years earlier in 1879? Julie K. Stein joined the Burke much more recently when she was appointed executive director in 2005. Today, Julie's going to tell us about the new Burke the result of a 10-year campaign to create a new facility. Julie will share how the museum was turned inside out to reveal the Burke's research and collections in a radically transparent and accessible way. Previously, Julie served as the museum's curator of archaeology. Today, she maintains a professor position in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Washington. Julie has excavated archaeological sites on Washington's San Juan Islands since 1983 and continues to collaborate on research projects involving geoarchaeology. Please welcome to Rotary, Julie Stein. Thank you very much. I think we're going to launch my slides here. There they are. That is the New Burke Museum in the lower right. And the next slide gives, you, uh, gives me an opportunity for a land acknowledgement. I know we are all now on many different landscapes but the Burke Museum stands on the lands of the native peoples of Washington State, whose ancestors resided here since time immemorial. Many indigenous people thrive in this place, alive and strong. Next slide. As uh, was just mentioned by Kim, the usual first question I get is, who is Burke in the Burke Museum's name? Uh, the beginnings of the Burke Museum started with that group of teenage boys that she referred to, the young naturalists. There's four, a picture of four of them on the left. Uh, Edmund Meany, uh, uh, Charlie Denny, many of the children of the first uh, Euro-American settlers here. They were encouraged by a judge here in town, Judge Thomas Burke, the dapper fellow in the middle of this slide. He was a railroad lawyer, a lawyer specializing in railroad law, and traveled out here with Sam Hill and fell in love with the Northwest and stayed. He uh, married the daughter of his law partner, Caroline McGilvra Burke, the beautiful woman on the right. He's probably most famous in this region today for the railroad that he built with his friend, Patrick Gilman. It was a railroad stretching from downtown Seattle to the north end of Lake Washington, uh, where the forests uh, were being cut down and the lumber was then shipped back to uh, downtown. Um, when that railroad was no longer functioning, they deeded it to the city of Seattle, and it is now the Burke Gilman Trail. I'm always surprised by how many people don't realize that it's all the same person. He was involved in the establishment of Rotary Four, of the Rainier Club, and of the Symphony. She was in the group of women who started the Sunset Club. So they were very involved and they had no children. Upon their death, they deeded their entire estate to the Washington State Museum that was started by those fellows on the left. She was an avid collector of Native American art and he was an avid collector of natural specimens and a hunter and loved the work that they were doing to identify and document the animals and plants that were here in the Northwest. The nat young naturalists were very concerned that they were disappearing very quickly. So the next slide 
Since that time, we have accumulated over 16 million objects. And these objects are animals like birds and mammals and fish, huge fish collection, turtles, spiders, snakes, uh, a huge uh, culture collection from cultures around the Pacific, and perhaps we are best known for our Northwest native art. We have fossils, including a giant T-Rex skull that I will show you in a while, uh, as well as little tiny micro fossils and fossil plants. And our archeology span collection is extremely strong and represents the state of Washington. Here you see one of our faculty curators, uh, John Klicka, showing a young enthusiast uh, section of the bird collection. All our curators are faculty at the University of Washington, and the Burke is located on the campus of the University of Washington. Next slide. The users of the collections are not only biologists and paleontologists that are comparing life uh, and genetics across the world, but the descendants of some of the communities whose ancestors made these works of art. This woman here is Lou Ann Neal. She is an artist and she came to the Burke to study models of totem poles. The whole function of a model was to teach somebody the proportions and the engineering of how to, how to create the object in full form. She was going to carve a totem pole and was studying these models and lo and behold, much to her surprise, found out that her grandmother, Ellen, was the carver who made these model totem poles. So it is a way of carrying on the tradition from uh, across the generations and on to future generations. Next slide. The old Burke was located on the northwest corner of campus and it was hidden very very well hidden behind trees and bushes. It was built in 1962 and it had absolutely no air conditioning. There were no museum professionals involved in its construction. Um, the next slide shows you that we also had completely run out of uh, space. This is our shell collection. It's actually being packed up to move to the new Burke, but it gives you a real sense of just how overcrowded we were. Next slide. Another problem with the old Burke was that if we ever wanted to show the collections to the public, we had to pick them up and move them out to the lobby and to the galleries. These students and the collections manager are moving that skull of a sperm whale so that we can feature it for Meet the Mammals Day. This is bad for the students' backs as well as bad for the collections itself. To compensate for this, the next slide, I would give people behind the scenes tours. If they knew me, they would be able to go through the gallery. I would lead them down a secret stairway in the corner to the basement where they would see all kinds of archaeologists working and the collections, shelves filled with mammoth and mastodon bones, preparators who were taking the rocks off the bone, and inevitably after 10 minutes they would say, I had no idea that you were doing all of this somewhere in the behind all of the galleries. This became so powerful to me and to everyone at the museum that when we designed the new museum, we were dedicated to turning it inside out so that no matter who came to the museum, no matter what day they came, no matter if they knew me or not, they would be able to see the collections and see the work that we were doing. And inside out became a catchphrase for this concept of showing people really the real work of the museum. The next slide. 
We did this by, um, well, first of all, we had to answer the number one question that somebody, that people always ask, and that was, how will your staff feel if they are working in uh, front of a window that is being viewed by the public? They always use the word fishbowl, which I uh, actually said um, you couldn't use that word anymore. So we built a prototype, and that's what you're looking at in this slide. Uh, you can see we made it out of plywood in the old Burke. We had uh, windows that you can see our staff through the windows. We had shelves that explained to the public what was going on. Uh, on the window in the right, you can see there's a shelf with objects. There's uh, uh, words on the windows that explain what they're doing. But the truth of the matter was they didn't need any explanation at all. The next slide shows you that what they really liked to do was just watch the people work and read the little whiteboards and all the fun and uh, informal messages of the people. What you're looking at here is Prim on the left and Michael on the right and they are prepping a T-Rex skull. The brown that you see within the red is the bone and the white that is very bright in the middle of the slide is the rock they're taking off. If you look very closely to Prim's elbow and hand, you can see the teeth of the T-Rex sticking out going in a downward left uh, direction. The sign on the whiteboard says, oh my, what big teeth you have, and it's signed the wolf. So the funny messages on whiteboards is what people wanted. We saved thousands of dollars on professionally printed labels and shelves and cases when all they really wanted to do was to see the real work and the real people. Uh, the red thing you see look, that looks like a rotisserie is holding that incredibly heavy T-Rex skull and all the plaster and rock, and they would dial it around one way or the other to um, complete the preparation. It is now on display at the Burke Museum. The next slide, please. So with what we learned in the old Burke and with our prototype, we built the new Burke, which you see here. The whole theme of Inside Out is carried through in the architecture as well as the galleries and the experiences. The architect was Tom Kundig. He's a uh, principal at Olson Kundig Architects. It was completed and opened in October of 2019, just last fall. And what you see in the middle lower part of this slide is a grid that is a pivot wall. It is a door that opens up to this cafe. Uh, our cafe is run by a restaurant um, owner named Off the Res, and they feature fry bread tacos, very popular. And the rolling pin thing on the top of the grid is a counterbalance so that you can open this pivot door. We do it every day. We used to do it every day uh, by uh, mechanically with your hand, not with a machine. You wind uh, this set of levers and pulleys that use the counterbalance to open up this entire side of the museum and becomes the canopy, we pull the desks and the chairs and tables out and we sit, you can sit outside. We are very, very, very excited about doing this this spring and this summer. We haven't done it yet, but uh, there's wood on the outside and uh, you can kind of get the idea that inside out is a theme that travels throughout the whole um, experience. In the next slide, you see the inside. The museum is three floors. The floor on the bottom you see in the center lower part is where the culture galleries and, and collections are. The middle floor, second floor, is where that man is pointing. 
That is the biology collections and exhibits. And the grate and fencing you see on the upper right is the third floor where fossils and archaeology are. The wall that they are pointing to is a mural that's 60 feet high and contains icons uh, developed by artist um, Ryan Fetterson. She took these images from the museum's collections, made them into black and white vinyl press-ons, and one image uh, morphs into the other. You can look at it all day long. It's the most incredible uh, mural. The inside of the museum is open from the top to the bottom with light pouring in from skylights and has that same feeling of inside out. You can see outside, the outside comes in, the inside goes out. Next slide. True to our promise, we have galleries, traditional galleries where you have objects and cases and mounted skeletons with lots of labels. But notice the man in the back who is looking through those windows. That is the collections and the workrooms of the paleontologists. So while you're looking in the gallery, you're also looking at real paleontologists doing real work. These are graduate students, undergraduates, volunteers, researchers from around the world. Next slide. We have educators that are teaching our field uh, field programs that take field trips from K through 12. And can you imagine not only touching that whale vertebrae, but turning around and seeing a real scientist working in a lab and getting a sense of what it means to work uh, at a museum, at a university doing research. Next slide. Here you're seeing the mammals being a uh, collection, being stored on fixed shelving. And uh, every once in a while, someone will walk by and come and take one of those skulls because somebody needs to see it for one reason or the other. The next slide. In the culture collection, the objects reside on compactors that slide along the floor so that we have very efficient storage uh, units. Any day you come, you can see uh, the collection and the people working on the collections. Next slide. Here is a biologist who's working on birds. Notice that this child is leaning up against the window with both hands pressed against the glass. As you can imagine, we buy glass cleaner in the gallon drums and are always looking for volunteers who are willing to um, clean glass. Next slide. This is the fossil prep lab and this picture is taken from inside the lab looking out at the visitors. You can see the looks on their faces, the questions they're asking each other. They can't talk to the people doing the prep but they're very engaged. You'll notice that the people doing the preparation are really not looking at the public. They're very happy doing their work, focusing. No one taps on the glass either. It's just an amazing, we didn't know. We thought maybe they would, but they, they don't. Next slide. This was a surprise. This is our bio prep lab and people told us that the public would not enjoy seeing the remains of an, a California condor being dissected and prepared into a study skin. And yet that's what you're looking at right here. The man with the blue coat on is actually taking apart a California condor, preparing it for our collection. While the man with the red t-shirt is um, preparing uh, some skeletons to be cleaned by our flesh-eating beetles. This is the most popular place in the museum and little kids have their noses pressed against this window and um, they said they wouldn't like the blood and guts but you know what guys they love blood and guts. Next slide please. 
On occasion, we would open the door and allow people to talk to the workers inside the workrooms. This is our contemporary culture gallery, and they're looking at a very fancy um, hat and objects um, from, I believe this is Southeast Asia. Next slide. Here they're asking an archaeologist how they prepare the holders that hold the objects and protect them in case of earthquake or if um, so they don't roll off the shelves. Next slide. And here they're asking a biologist about her research on squirrels, the different squirrels that are on the eastern part of the Cascades from those on the western Cascades. Next slide. We have an artist studio. This is David Boxley. For those of you who know Northwest Carvers, Northwest Native Artist Carvers, he opened up the door of the artist studio and let people come in and ask him questions about his completed masks in the back, some of his tools that he uses to carve, or, to carve, or about just what he was doing right there. There's a different, there was a different artist every uh, week and uh, sometimes every uh, different one that would be there for a couple weeks and change and rotate on a monthly basis. Next slide. Occasionally we would open the door and just let people walk into the collections. This shot shows you both the workspace where our curator is working here and the collection storage area in the back. It gives you an idea of how big these rooms are. And this father and son were asking her about what she was doing. She was entering things into a database and taking pictures of microfossils and asking her why she did that, what kind of research questions, what kind of researchers around the world and information about climate change she could gain. Next slide. This is all made possible through volunteers that help the visitor understand what they're looking at, but occasionally the old visitor will ask questions that we don't know the answers to, the volunteers, and the woman that's in the teal uh, lanyard could then run uh, into the collections, get an answer, and run back out uh, so that the curiosity of this little one here is uh, satisfied. And oh, next slide. This is the last slide. And usually what I would tell people is I would invite you to come to the Burke Museum. This is one of our visitor service people at the admissions desk. And she's saying, would you like two tickets? And they're saying, yes, we would like two tickets. Obviously, we are closed, as are all museums in the nation and in the area, uh, but we invite you to come back uh, when we uh, reopen. We are now planning for reopening. I don't know the exact uh, time or date, but uh, we are, are creating a place and a situation that is safe for both our staff and for visitors that come. I saw some questions come in, so I would love to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And thanks also to your colleague, Rochelle Dickerson, for joining us for Rotary today and getting us ready to visit the new Burke. Now Mariah is going to help us answer some questions. All right, so the first question here, Let's see, I've got one from John Bridge asking if you could tell us a little bit more about the funding of the museum. What percentage of it comes from tickets or donations, uh, government funding, that kind of thing? The museum is funded just over 50% by the state through the University of Washington. So as the Washington State Museum, we are fiscally managed by the University of Washington. Another third of the museum is contributed income, and that we include the, uh, the endowment uh, payout. And another third is by earned revenue. So our earned revenue has gone to zero, as you can imagine. But with the state and endowment and contributions, 
we have been able to keep uh, about uh, 70 to 80% of our staff. All right, next question is from Laura Rehrman. She would like to know if the museum has online video or other resources that people can access right now. We have a robust digital program. It's called Burke From Home. It is a curriculum for teachers as well as parents. You can sign up if you put your email and a, a whole curriculum package is delivered to you once a week. There's also lots of activities. One that I love is how to make a nettle pesto uh, so that you can eat it from net nettles. Another is how to draw. There's a way to learn how to draw orcas and eagles. Uh, lots of scavenger hunt. And every Friday we have a trivia game that you can do virtually. It's uh, natural history and culture trivia, very popular. And uh, please join at seven o'clock on Fridays. All right, uh, next question from Ken Grant here is, you filled up your last building over the years. How long until you fill up this new building? We built a new building uh, with the thought that it would uh, take 20 years to fill it up. The curators were asked to uh, estimate what the collections would look like in, uh, and we gave them enough space for 20 years. What I have found with humans is that you, when asked about space, you always overestimate so that you get as much space as you can get. So we think we're good for a while and the compactor storage that rolls along the floor uh, also gives us some incredible capacity. Uh, it is a very bright, open and airy, uh, adaptable, flexible space. So I'm hoping that it's good for 50 to 100 years in the future. All right, question from Paul here. Did you or your staff encounter any unexpected challenges by opening the Burke inside out? Well, uh, yes. Uh, if you give people uh, access and you open the door, uh, they'll come in. And we were not quite prepared for as many people to come in as far as they came in. So we realized we had to give people very clear instructions of how far in they could, they were welcome to come. And it's a lesson we could have learned from retailers uh, very easily, but uh, it was a pleasant surprise and people were very uh, happy to conform to the um, new rules and clear signage. All right, and question from Caroline here. What's your favorite object in the Burt collection? This is like asking who is your favorite child, you know. So it's very difficult to answer this question. I would say that the T-Rex skull is pretty cool because it is the biggest, most complete T-Rex skull in the world, which really puts us on the map. So I invite you all to come and see it. The last, well, there are others questions. Uh, looks like I have one more here that you didn't already at least partially answer. And that one's from Kathy. And she's wondering what was done with the old building. Oh, the old building was demolished and it has now been completely landscaped in a beautiful Burke yard with native plants. And there is also, because it's the University of Washington, there is a parking lot there. So the last thing I wanted to say about the Burke was that um, turning a mu museum inside out, as far as we know, has never been done in the entire world. So we gave a presentation in the very first week of March, right before COVID hit everybody, um, at a building museum conference and told people what we have done and they are really incredulous and the whole world is watching what we're doing and to see whether it works. So this museum is in your backyard and we strongly hope that you will come and experience it 
and spread the word and tell us whether you think it works or not. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And I'm really delighted to know that I'm not the only one who does not under, did not understand Inside Out before because it's a brand new concept. Congratulations. Please join us next week, May 20th, when we will have another look at innovation. When Adam Brotman, CEO of Brightloom, will tell us how consumer brands can truly grow their business from the inside out using resources they already have, like their digital ecosystems. Thank you to all our program participants today, Todd Sommerfeld, Trish Bostrom, Julie Stein, and Rochelle Dickerson. Also, thanks to our excellent Rotary staff, Mariah Kempton, and our Executive Director, Caroline Bobanik. We're also grateful for the sponsors of our YouTube channel. Today, we thank our gold sponsor, Bob Alexander, who I saw in the tiles. There he is. Hey, Bob. As well as two of our bronze sponsors, Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts and Joel Farrell of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. Now, before we adjourn, a reminder to wait just a moment if you'd like Mariah to assign you to a chat room where you can visit with your fellow Rotarians. And today's question, if you choose to answer it, is in addition to visiting the New Burke Museum, what are you most looking forward to doing when social distancing ends? Great to see everyone. Stay engaged, stay healthy. We need you, our community needs you, we are adjourned.